Hey, uh, happy Tuesday to you. Let's see if I can get things straightened out here again. We're kind of, eh, it's better. Um, so, uh, local folks, um, what do you think of this weather? Are we finally going to have some winter? Uh, I, I was super excited when they were forecasting uh, the snow. I'm a little disappointed this morning when it was, it, it, you know, it was weird. It wasn't really rain. But it wasn't snow either. It was almost like slush coming down out of the sky. Um, and then uh, walking home this evening, uh, thankfully, a lot of people, I think, were were heeding the the weather warnings, the traffic people telling people to stay home and uh, not really you know, move around unless they really had to. Uh, so I had a, a pretty easy walk home um, using mostly streets, although there's some, a fair amount of sidewalks that were shoveled off. But what was weird, um, I kept getting hit. You can kind of see on my hat. Um, this some of this is dropping from the trees, but some of it uh, seems to still be coming from the sky. Some of these smaller drips. It's sort of warmed up again. This afternoon we had flakes. I kid you not. They look like they were the size of ping pong balls that were coming down. Um, and it's just you know it's been up down all around. Uh, I have not yet shoveled. I understand it's like moving wet cement. So I might save that fun uh, for tomorrow morning. But anyway, I hope uh, hope you're warm and dry and safe and looking forward to an hour of good nature. Um, and I, I have to apologize. I've got a bunch of different things here and I'm not sh exactly sure how it's going to go because I'm going to have to share and then not share. And as you know, sharing is not one of my strong suits. Sharing this computer screen. I'm a pretty good sharer otherwise, but um, I think I'm going to start with this. Are you all familiar with this stuff here? This is, um, I think they call it uh, landscape netting or landscape mesh. It's oftentimes it's put down in areas that have just been freshly uh, seeded. There's usually uh, some sort of cover that's put over it, uh, put over the seeds like uh, straw. Uh, and then they put this stuff down to keep it all in place. Supposedly, it biodegrades. So usually once the landscaper puts this stuff down, they're down. Uh, they're Once they put it down, they're done. They don't come back and pick it up again. But, you know, it it's tough stuff. Um, it, it does start to break apart after a while. But, you know, if I were to try and cut this, uh, pull it apart with my hands, it, it takes quite a bit of strength. And I actually, when I was playing with it earlier, I actually kind of cut my finger on it. Um, this is a wildlife hazard. Uh, now, tonight, a lot of it is covered up with uh, with snow or slush or whatever it is that's coming down right now. Um, <clears throat> but it is something, uh, unfortunately, this actually came from a St. Charles Park District park. Um, there's a, a lot of it that's been put down over here at Baker Field as they've gone through the renovations there. Um, I'm seeing now Baker Field, uh, there's, I don't think there's any snakes that live there, but this is a, a big problem if there's snakes in the area. What I'm concerned about is come springtime, birds taking this and trying to use it as nesting material. This has a lot of the attractive qualities they look for, long strands that can be woven together, but then also strands that can uh, get wound around uh, a leg or a toe uh, or a wing. So uh, in fact, as we'll see, uh, there's, uh, there's some other wildlife hazards that um, I'll rant about later. But anyway, uh, if you could, could do me a favor, or actually do the wildlife a favor, when you see this stuff uh, around, and, and it is quite plentiful, especially after uh, you, you, you know, train your eye to look for it, if you could try and pick it up now, I know one time, gosh, I was trying to pick some up at uh, a different park, and it's one of these things where you know it just keeps going, um, and it, it can end up, uh, you know, um, being. It's actually easier if you you know use a knife to to try and cut it up as you're pulling it up, and it, it looks like you were saying that you've had some experience with it too. Um, uh, four or five years ago, and you still have it coming up. I tear it free. And it is not degraded yet. Yeah. So, you know, 
photo degradation is something that, you know, yes, it, it can happen and it probably will happen, but will it happen before something gets uh, hopelessly trapped in it? I, I don't know. I doubt it. Um, and again, I, yeah, I have seen uh, animals, uh, particularly snakes, suffer from this. So uh, this might come up again when nesting season comes around, but uh, since uh, uh, I was seeing it quite a bit in my walks to and from work over at uh, Bakerfield, I thought I'd bring it up and just uh, pass it along to you for something to be aware of and wary of should it um, factor into any future plans you might have. Um, let's see, from here, uh, you know, let's do it. So today at work, I was getting some materials ready for our 2024 spring ephemerals project. <clears throat> kind of ironic, huh? It's my first day of real winter weather. And uh, we chose that to uh, think about spring to create the QR code for our 2024 spring ephemerals project and to uh, get that uh, web page on the iNaturalist platform um, uh, put together. I, I thought it might be kind of cool. Uh, it's, it's okay. So here's going to, this is going to be our first share. So bear with me here. Um, we're going to optimize and we're going to go Valley. Which one should I pick? I'm going to pick this one. And then we're going to go, there's our commercial for the St. Charles Park District, stcparks.org. Um, there we go. So here is our 2024 uh, homepage. Uh, and I love that they put this countdown. There are 51 days, three hours, 48 minutes, and 25 seconds remaining until this project kicked off. If you're not familiar with it, if you haven't participated in the past, what it is, it's it's uh, iNaturalist has um, the ability, uh, anybody can can uh, open an account and anybody can create a, a research project. This was something uh, the Park District started uh, in the pandemic, the pandemic year, when we were unable to really do much in the way of programming, we weren't allowed to have groups gathering. Um, and we had to limit the number of people coming into the nature center. But this gave us a way to, to uh, get in touch with people, to send people to our parks um, independently or with their families and to just kind of look at what's coming up in springtime. It's a pretty joyful time of year uh, coming out, you know, after uh, the winter season. And this um, gave something, uh, people something to focus on. Um, We've got several partners that um, uh, put uh, uh, ephemeral project signs up in their parks, uh, Red Oak Nature Center down in North Aurora, uh, the Wildflower Sanctuary in Batavia, the King County Forest Preserve District has signage at uh, various uh, locations, including Johnson's Mound and I believe Bliss Woods. Um, let's see, what's the Campton Township open space? Um, well, you know what? <laughs> They're listed here. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Wild Ones. Yes. Uh, Greater Keene County Wild Ones has been a big proponent of this project as well. Uh, Geneva Park District and the Conservation uh, Foundation have also uh, been contributors to the project. So that's, that's what the uh, uh, 2024 project page looks like. Uh, and again, it's inaturalist.org. Um, you can find us by searching from the homepage. But I thought it might be fun to take a look at the results from last year's project. Uh, now, this is um, something where we have seen um, growth each year, both in the number of participants, uh, known on here as uh, observers, and in the number of observations. Um, yeah, species too have gone up and it's it's not you know um it's not like we're looking to find uh the rarest uh plants that are out there um it's really more a means of getting people to start paying more attention to their surroundings of, of engaging them with uh what there is to see uh, coming up as uh, the weeks progress. Uh, this runs from uh, beginning of March to the end of May. Um, 
Now here you can look at this data in different ways. You can um, look from a people perspective, you can see who was out there and um, who did the, you know, the bulk of the observing um, and how many species these people were able to uh, find. Um, I think this column is the, the most interesting, the most observed species. Every year that we've done this, the trillium, uh, the red one, what we call the prairie trillium has come out on top. Um, uh, they, flipping through these, uh, it's a nice way to just familiarize yourself with what there is out there. This is not in chronological order. I should, this is um, you know, in, in, uh, listed in terms of like, you know, the most popular, the one that is seen the most. Um, something though that, that jumped out at me as I was scrolling down through these different species and it doesn't give you so much to look forward to uh, as we get closer and closer to spring. Um, butterweed. So this is a plant that popped up uh, kind of on my radar, maybe I don't know, four years ago or so. I remember talking to uh, John Dewar, the former uh, director of the Forest Preserve District and uh, the gentleman who has a forest preserve named after him. And he said he remembered uh, when, when he was still working, when he was director of the Forest Preserve, going down to Springfield uh, for uh, you know, different meetings and such. And they would see butterweed down there. And he, he said that over time, he noticed that they would start seeing it farther and farther north. This plant has been on the move now for several years. It's well established now here in Kane County. Um, it is actually a native plant. It's native to the Midwest and I believe the South, uh, Southern states or at least the Southeast. Uh, but it's one of those plants that is um, pretty aggressive. Uh, I think some sources uh, refer to it as invasive. It seeds prolifically, um, and it so it it spreads and and can spread quite rapidly um, throughout an area. I remember seeing, uh, in fact, I kind of miss it now. Uh, some of the uh, retirement facilities that I visit are up in South Elgin and Elgin, so I drive up McLean Boulevard and uh, Boulevard Parkway Road, McLean Avenue. You know, McLean. Uh, that uh, runs north and south off of Route 31. Um, there's uh, there's a McLean Fen, and then there used to be open space next to it that's now um, under development. It's becoming a, a subdivision called Beckett's Landing. That used to be uh, farm fields, and then when those fields started to go fallow, <clears throat> butterweed popped up throughout that area. Um, and like I said, I kind of miss it now because um, that area is all houses. But yeah, I see it in some of our forest preserves. I have yet to see it in any of our St. Charles Park District parks, but um, it is something that last year, uh, I believe that said there were 25 observations um, group that load back up. Um, it does stick out. There, as we scroll through, oh, that's probably where did it go here? The andelions. There it is. So there were 25 observations last year. Well, I went back and I looked at the 2022 um, Spring Ephemerals Project, and we had 15 observations. And in 2021, there were zero. So does that mean like the plant is spreading? It, it might, it, it might just mean, you know, we've got more observers and observations, but it's just something um, maybe you two could start keeping an eye out for. Um, it is um, the way it spreads. It kind of reminds me of, and let's see, I don't know if that's on here or not. Um, the uh, yellow rocket, um, which is a, a mustard, um, let me see if that shows up on here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh Hello, Violet. Iris. Yellow Archangel. It's 
smooth yellow, but okay. So no, the uh, the yellow rocket um, doesn't appear to be showing on here, but that's another, um, oh, garden yellow rocket. Um, this is another plant that spreads pretty aggressively. Our, our mustards, um, they produce a ton of seeds, hence uh, garlic mustard. Um, but uh, you can see its flower looks quite different. The um, uh, flower of the uh, butterweed is more your typical raid flower, uh, pretty pretty large in size. I would say it's maybe two inches across, maybe more. Anyway, something to keep your eye out on as we tick off those days, count down to the start of the Spring Ephemerals Project on March 1st. Okay, from here, uh, no, I'm not sure. We'll see if this goes. I might have to stop the share and start it again. Um, I wanted to revisit a topic that we um, had talked about last week. Sort of when we talked about that um, snail that uh, is at my friend Peggy's Nature Center out in DeKalb County. Let's put this up here. Um, this um this is not that snail. This is actually a native snail. Um, one that uh is all over. If you go to uh if you're local, you go over to Fearson Creek Fen. Um you'll see th these empty shells just literally they're they're on the paths, they're in the soil. After a burn, these uh, snail shells are really obvious. And I, I they, like there were so many, um, it was actually concerning because usually around here, when you see a, a lot of uh, representatives of any organism, whether it's a, a plant or an animal, when you start seeing you know, numbers in the thousands, uh, you start to think that it maybe is uh, an introduced species. It's an invader. It shouldn't be here. But this is actually um, thanks to, and some of you know, uh, Maureen Renna, she is uh, part of the King County Certified Naturalist Program. Her son, Stephen, actually uh, is a uh, marine and estuary biology major, has taken a class on snails. Uh, Maureen had noticed this um, snail during a class we held at the Fen last fall. She took this picture on the right and she sent it to her son just to see, hey, is this something that, you know, is usual? Is it something we should expect to see here? And he looked at it and he goes, mom, you can't identify a snail from that angle. You need to show me the other side of it. So she drove all the way back up to the Fen from her house, um, found another snail, took a picture of the other side of it, um, as well as, uh, my screen froze. There, this one, um, this, that shows you the size. Now, the, the snail that we talked about last week that, that Peggy has, it's about the size of a half dollar. Uh, it's, it's quite large. This is much smaller. This, this is somewhere between the, the size of a dime and a nickel. Uh, and her son was able to identify it as uh, a native species called the striped white lip. Uh, it's important uh, to the ecology of uh, moist or wet areas. It tends to live in places just like Fearson Creek Fen. I don't know that it's necessarily dependent on a fen sort of habitat. I don't know if it needs an alkaline water source. I think it mostly just needs the moisture, the uh, periodic flooding that might occur. Um, and it it does, it feeds uh, mostly on uh, young plants. Um, probably its role then in the, the ecology of the area would be to, to serve as a natural control over uh, some plants. Um, it's not known to be transported around by people. Um, and it's just, but it, it is, uh, a native, uh, land snail, a hard shelled, uh, snail that we do, uh, expect to see here in Kane County. So if you happen to find yourself at the Fen over the next few months, well, not, you know, over the next few days, cause there's, these are going to be covered up with snow, but as things start to, to open up again later this winter and into spring, keep an eye out for this snail. Uh, you'll, 
be surprised at how many there are. And they're just there doing their thing. Now, uh, from here, we're going to stay with these slides. This this doesn't have uh, uh, anything to do with snails, but it does refer back to our first topic, hazards to wildlife. Um, this is a picture that my friend Amber took on Christmas Eve. Now, I've mentioned Amber before. She lives down in uh, Batavia, a lovely home that uh, with along with several others is situated situated around the edge of a, uh, a retention pond. Well, there's fish in the pond. There's a lot of kids that go fishing there. I can probably see where this is going. Uh, Christmas Eve, Amber, uh, I, I can't remember if she said they were getting ready to go out or if they were getting ready to have company or if they're just getting ready to celebrate. Uh, you know, her husband and her kids. But anyway, she she happens to notice there's some some movement uh, out there on the pond. She goes out and this is what she finds. Um, this is a gray horned owl and this is fishing line. And uh, the line is wrapped tightly around the end of its wing. Now, Amber, she has actually worked uh, in a few different capacities in wildlife rehabilitation. She was up at the Alaska Sea Life uh, Center uh, rescuing sea animals. She actually got to uh, help groom a sea otter, a baby sea otter that was orphaned. Uh, she's not a stranger to rescuing animals. Uh, this was not part of her Christmas Eve plans, though, and the, the water, because we've had such a warm winter that that pond was not frozen. She went upstairs, uh, dug out her uh, waders, went back down, cut this animal down out of the tree. Uh, it turns out, you know, if, if it um, it, it had to struggle to keep its head out of the water. Anytime it started to relax, uh, its face would fall in the water. This thing was very close to drowning. It was exhausted. She doesn't know how long it had been stuck like that, but, um, all right, let's see if we can get this to advance. There is another slide here. <laughs> uh, my computer seems to be a little slow. I tried that way. There we go. Um, so there he is. Uh, it, it is a male great horned owl. There he is in the box. Um, look at that wing. And there is no way he was going to be able to get out of that himself. In fact, I think it was one of these situations where the more he struggled, the tighter the uh, the line became. Uh, she was, uh, and again, this is Christmas Eve, she was able to get a hold of uh, CARE, Cane Area Rehabilitation and Education, uh, the Wildlife Rescue Center up here uh, on the north side of St. Charles, and some volunteers came down and uh, got the owl. Uh, they were able to remove that fishing line. Um and the, the owl, surprisingly, didn't seem to have any major injuries. There were no dislocations. There was no uh, broken bones or anything. It was it was stressed, um, exhausted. It really just needed some time to, to relax, uh, cool down, or regroup, recover, uh, which it did do. They were actually going to release it uh, yesterday. But... With the weather that was forecasted, they decided that maybe it would be in the owl's best interests to wait. So um, the owl is still uh, under the care of care. Now, th this is a it's a tricky thing. I don't know that that um, Amber was was fully on board with that decision because um, we are at the start now of you know, owls have been courting for the last couple of months. We've been hearing them hooting up in the trees and everything. And, and this is the, the time of year when uh, the females start laying eggs. So I don't know if, um, one, if this owl is attached, you know, two, if it's part of a, a mated pair. Um, I don't know, or she doesn't know, nobody knows if uh, it has a mate that's, you know, waiting for it and wondering what became of it. Um, and Amber had said there was this window um, 
can't remember if it was two or three weeks that she had learned about in her rehab training and said, you know, that is the crucial time that, you know, if an owl is, is able to be released within that time, it's going to ensure its reintegration back into its life. Um, it's going to go a lot more uh, smoothly if it occurs in that shorter window. I don't know. After this, um, we've got, I think, two snow systems coming through. And then after that, it's supposed to get really cold. I don't know exactly when Care is going to decide that it is okay to release the owl. He is, um, he's eating, getting, uh, his, he's got his strength back. He's probably ready to go, but um, uh, it hasn't happened yet. It's one of those uh, stay tuned types of situations. Amber uh, promised that she would let me know uh, when it is that the owl uh, does uh, get released. So I'll keep you posted on that. But it was um, uh, pretty dramatic. Certainly something Amber hadn't counted on doing uh, as part of her Christmas Eve celebrations. Okay, let's see. Now from here, um, Let's, uh, I'm going to stop the share for a minute, and we're going to go to a little bit of show and tell. It, Susie, I have been uh, enjoying this. You you gave this to me months ago. This is a book called uh, The Orkney Pocket Book, uh, all about the Orkney Vol. Now, uh, a lot of you I know are, are more well-traveled than I am. You are probably familiar with uh, Orkney Island uh, off the coast of Ireland. Well, um, let me see if I can hold that where you can see it a little bit better. Orkney, oh, there you can see the cute little face there. Orkney is uh, quite proud um, and actually a little worried about its vole population. Uh, these are animals, um, well here at the Orkney Islands, uh, this shows, this is a little key of the islands that it occurs on and the islands that it has not been seen. These are islands. So there, um, there is actually the first part of the book discusses where these things came from because um, there were, there's no evidence of uh, an ice bridge or a land bridge that would have allowed them to, uh, to land there. Um, it says, some people think we arrived on rafts of floating vegetation. Some think we came with the first farmers during the Neolithic period. Uh, maybe we were brought over as pets or even as food. Uh, after all, the Romans used to eat dormice. Um, Pam, it's the owl. Bring, oh, it's yeah. Hi, Susie. Scotland off Scotland. What was I said? Oh, I said Ireland. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Ireland, Island. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But I just thought in case somebody was correcting you, I it would be you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. And I say, yeah, you know, I really do need to get out more. <laughs> islands off the coast of Scotland. And yes. I know, you know right. rodents aren't, aren't your, um, Rodents aren't your your favorites, are they? No, they're not. And that little <laughs> bugger just scared the bejeebies out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but then you learned about them, and yeah, things are better, right? Cool. Yes. Well, you know, I have to say, I was struck um, as I read about this Scottish species. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, they they have a lot of aspects of their life that are very similar to the voles we see around here. And I think, all right, I'm going to try this now. I'm going to go back to our screen share. Um, uh, we're going to get rid of this, aren't we? Mm. All right, that one's stuck. So let's... Um, let me pick a different window here. Um, that's the one I wanted, right? Yeah. Well, gee whiz. How do I get rid of the owl? It's lovely it is. We need to move on. Um, well, you know what? I'm going to, there we go. 
Um, kind of save that. Let's go to our slides here. This is not um, an Orkney Islands vole. Uh, this is our, our local representative, uh, the, the meadow vole. But as you look at these pictures, I'm going to read uh, from this book, it says we have a short but eventful life. That certainly is true, uh, not only of the Orkney voles, but of the um, uh, local guys that we have here. It says we don't live very long, no more than two years, but we pack a lot in. From March to November, we give birth to two, three, or four uh, litters that consist of between two and 12 youngsters. Therefore, each female can produce up to 48 pups in a year, not unlike our local voles. In fact, I've heard sometimes, uh, depending on weather and the individual's longevity, that our local voles can actually give birth to up to six litters a year. Um, for the Orkney Island voles, it says the gestation period is 20 days, which compares very closely, I believe locally, they say about 21 days. So we're talking about three weeks. Um, our pups are fur uh, by about 10 days and are weaned by 16, which also aligns with the, uh, the voles we have here. About two weeks uh, it takes them to be weaned. Uh, and it also doesn't take us long to reproduce. Males can breed at 40 days and females at 28. That's four weeks. Um, uh, the turnover of our population is rapid. Males can partner up with up to four females, uh, although sometimes they will have just one. Uh, we live a flexible lifestyle so we can respond to changes in our environment. Um, so uh, a lot of what they describe in this little book actually matches what we see here. Uh, here's another look at the voles that we have here. You might be thinking, gee whiz, that looks an awful lot like a mouse. Uh, and yes, they are both rodents. Uh, and, and some people call these meadow voles field mice. Um, they are quite plentiful in our local fields. But here is a look at a mouse. Um, this was one that turned up dead uh, up the street from me here over at Davis Park. And if we just do a little bit of comparing and contrasting, the uh, the mouse has a pointy nose and a long tail. Uh, and the vole has a more rounded appearance in a, um, you can see it better, I think, in this, well, not really. It, it's, it's a more rounded look and um, a much shorter tail. I think you guys have heard me before call these nature's baked potatoes. They're shaped like potatoes. Uh, they go with everything. Uh, they're on a lot of creatures' diets. Um, and, and the mouse is uh, just got a, a, an overall, a, a more a skinnier and longer appearance as opposed to the rounder and chunkier look of the voles. The uh, reason I bring these guys up today is one, uh, Susie, the book, I've been meaning to mention this for a while. And two, um, with the snow that's coming down, these guys are, are both of actually the voles and the mice locally are going to get some measure of protection from uh, predators. In winter time, these guys really make good use of that layer of um, open space that forms between the ground and the snow that comes down. As the snow uh, hits the soil, there's a, a degree of, of warmth, a measure of uh, uh, warmth that is still radiating up uh, from the soil. You know, even though we've been in winter now for, uh, uh, oh geez, uh, almost a month, um, the, the soil is going to be uh, warmer than the uh, 32 degree snow that's coming down. And um, so the snow kind of will melt back a little bit in the space forms and uh, called the subnivian layer, the subnivian zone. And these little guys will um, uh, run back and forth underneath there out of the sight of predators like uh, owls and hawks. Now, owls especially are, are good at hearing the, uh, 
these little animals. So it, it, it's not a hundred percent, it's not foolproof, but um, the snow does uh, help their survival in winter time. Now in springtime, uh, I always get calls or emails from people who are so uh, very concerned about what has happened to their lawn. As these animals are moving back and forth underneath the snow cover, they're, they're following uh, the trails um, that they leave. They, they, they tend to use the same trails over and over again so that the grass can get kind of beat up looking. Um, it does recover quickly. Uh, it's not usually something that is um, long lasting. It, does, it is going to look pretty bad when the snow melts away, but it, it uh, once the grass greens up and starts to grow again, those trails are hard to discern uh, as we get into, say, later spring, May, June, uh, that time of year. Most signs of voles uh, and mice too have started to disappear. But I just thought, um, I was thinking about them as I was walking past the piling snow. And as the snow continues to accumulate, I think these guys will have a little bit easier time uh, avoiding the wintertime predators. Now, bad news for the predators, but good news for our rodents. Um, let's see. So this, this is a picture. There's actually, I think there's a couple of them here. And this goes back to that New Year's Day hike that we uh, were on out in uh, Kendall County at Hoover Forest Preserve uh, in Yorkville. This caught my eye. Uh, Miss Bonnie, you probably recognize it too. Uh, it almost looked like hazelnuts. They're about the same size. Um, here's another view. Uh, and, you know, hazelnuts, they have a pretty elaborate husk that's got uh, sort of a leafy aspect to it. Um, but uh, this, what this, um, these objects were growing on were most certainly not a hazelnut bush. It turns out this is yet another gall um, of the hackberry. Hackberries are a, a local tree. Um, we talked about them a few weeks ago about the berries and how you can make a delicious drink from them. Well, hackberries, their leaves are oftentimes um, home to uh, little creatures that live in galls. Uh, it's called the hackberry leaf nipple gall. Um, and they, uh, you'll, you'll see just all maybe, you know, a dozen or more galls on a single leaf. So hackberries are very prone to these um, these types of growth. This is not uh, a leaf gall. This um, I looked it up. I found it on Bug Guide. It's called the hackberry pediol gall psyllid. So um, psyllids are um, little creatures. Let me see if there's a picture of the actual animal. They're they're uh, like a leaf hopper. If we follow, this is what I love about bug guy. They will be able, you can follow the taxonomy of a creature just by backing up through the ID. Um, the psyllids are uh, hemipterans. They look a lot like some of the plant hoppers or leaf hoppers that we see um, on other types of plants. Uh, they are specific to the, um, there's another picture of one. Here, um, specific to uh, hackberries, uh, and they describe them as big. Where is it here? Uh, large and robust, uh, much larger than other members of the genus, um, five to six millimeters, so um, over half a centimeter in length. Um, they're not likely to be confused with any other members of the genus. Uh, and, and we, I don't know that I would be able to identify this little creature. They, they look kind of like miniature cicadas, don't they? But um, these growths are the giveaway. In this time of year, they're quite obvious. If you're out uh, looking for hackberry berries to make a delicious beverage from, um, look, you'll probably see these pediol galls growing off of the plant too. Kind of cool. And um, yet another example of um, just the layers of connections that occur, even on our most common uh, trees, of which the hackberry certainly is one. So here's, uh, actually here's a look inside them. 
uh, appears to be several growing inside that little structure. And then here they are at maturity. Pretty cool, huh? Once you start, it's just just like the the landscaping fabric and in uh, vole trails. You know, once you notice it one place, you're going to start to see it in lots of other places too. All right, let's go back here. Let's see, that's the uh, golf here. It's the up close view of the golf. Really hard too. Um, poked that a little bit. It's um, it would be hard work for a, a bird or a other animal to to um, peck into that or chew into that. Uh, last week, we also mentioned um, this bittersweet. And you know, there's there's a lot of guides out there uh, that give tips on how to identify American bittersweet versus uh, the oriental, the introduced uh, an invasive species of bittersweet. And a lot of the guides talk about uh, the, the color of the seed coverings, you know, orange or red or yellow. Um, and then they also mention that the berries tend to be clustered at the ends of the branches in the um, American bittersweet, but they are um, spread out along the the uh, uh, the vine and uh, is it at the junctures with the leaves uh, there's a, um, a different in the difference in the growth habit between the two now this vine with these uh, clusters of berries at what look like the ends of each of these little vines you can zoom in here to see this too um, the way these were clustered, it certainly looked as though this might be American bittersweet, but it turns out it's not. This is, uh, in fact, oriental bittersweet, but uh, through the process, uh, um, Kim, I don't know if Kim is on tonight. Kim is uh, president of our local uh, Wild Ones chapter, Greater King County Wild Ones, and um uh, she took it to uh, one of the restoration ecologists that she knows, and uh, that person looked at it and actually um, took the berries in their hand and smashed them, uh, and there were several seeds, and that's the kicker with these. If you find bittersweet berries and you open them up, um, smash that berry, if you find five seeds or multiple seeds in each berry, then it's the oriental. If you smash the berry and there's only one seed inside, then it's the American. Uh, so I thought that was a terrific uh, and, and a much more um, objective way to identify uh, bittersweet. Uh, these other um, you know, guidance of you know, where the berries are growing or the, the color of the um, the seed cover here, um, very subjective, and it can even, you know, there's, there's, all of our eyes are different, lighting conditions are different, but taking those berries and smashing them uh, carefully, and then if it does turn out to be oriental bittersweet, make sure you don't throw it on the ground in disgust, because then you're just going to be spreading it even more, um, but a handy tip and one um, we can all use to help identify this plant that, um, now, knowing that it is the introduced species, look at it, all of this curly vine going up this tree here. Let's zoom in just a little bit. All of this growth here going up and up and around and over it is actually growing between several trees here. Um, and it also, it'll twist around and it'll actually yeah, kind of um, strangulate uh, the uh, trees that it grows on. Um, it's, this is all it curling up over here. They get a ride to the tree next door. Um, that is all oriental bittersweet. So, uh, looks like a little work lies ahead for, uh, employees there at the Kendall County Forest Preserve District. If they want to keep that invasive, uh, knocked out, get it, uh, taken out of there. Let's see, what else do we have? Oh, this is a little tracking puzzle. Um, 
and it's funny i i know the animal that made these and yet i would walk by this and be oh what's that I, this was at hickory knolls and it was on saturday uh this coincidentally our uh it was the uh date of our second annual January Jamboree, which was a, was a really fun event, a great reason for families to get out, uh, get out of the house, get some fresh air. Uh, there were a lot of snow-based activities and fortuitously it had snowed, so there was nice cover on the ground. Um, I was uh, with you, Laura, I was leading, um, we, uh, tag team leading, hikes with family groups uh, through the natural area. And we had um, a lot of stuffed animals placed so that, you know, kids could could help find those animals on the way. But then there were there were these tracks. And as I said, I know the animal that made these uh, and I would get fooled every time I walked by them. It looks like deer tracks, doesn't it? But if we look here, so here is um, uh, the old lip balm, two and five eighths inches. Uh, these are, are there. There's a few differences here when we start to look at them. Uh, one, they're they're pretty small. Uh, there's unlikely to be a deer uh, without small of feet um, out and about now. Most of our young of the year have grown up, and their feet are very similar to the size of their parents. Um, the stride isn't very long, and then they're just they're kind of more rounded. You know, deer tracks tend to be pointy. Um, as the, the two toes come together up here at the front as the animal walks along. So um, this animal, animals, I should say, there were two of them, are Merle and Norman. They are the uh, the Primrose Farm goats who were also uh, making an appearance at the um, uh, January Jamboree. Uh, these two were such a hoot. Uh, I, I loved watching them. They uh, Elson cleared some snow out of the way so they could munch on that grass, but they are just, they're like uh, furry little dogs. You know, she has them there on the leash. And uh, as people would come up, they immediately would go over to them to kind of shake them down to see if they had any treats. And if they didn't have any treats, well, then they'd chew in their coat or, you know, nuzzle in their pockets. Um, they were just, they were really pretty comical, pretty fun to watch. I thought they were a great addition. Uh, to the event, and they made some fun tracks. And this, uh, Laura, I'm going to zoom in here. Um, this was so cool. At the end of the event, the snow started coming down again, and they it, it's like perfect snowflakes were dropping down out of the sky. Uh, and uh, Laura's head was serving as the perfect um, landing spot for them. Uh, it was a great day to be. Wow! Oh, oh. <laughs> hey, let's move on. You just showed my nose. Go back. <laughs> but you know what? It's not doing anything. It's not dripping. It's not being, you know. Done. But wasn't that cool? Look at you've got this like little little um, christening of snowflakes. I didn't realize how gray I was. <laughs> That's the one that's, those are highlights, Laura. <laughs> those are highlights and, and with pretty snowflake sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> but look at look at how perfect. They say, you know, they've got the six points to them, the six sides, and you just had the most perfect representatives landing there on your, like the crown. Uh, <laughs> the, the queen of the jamboree. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, let's move on. Um, the, the, the the saga of the walnuts in the trees continues. Uh, this was the latest one. Uh, I was up uh, at Tekka with the Woods on Sunday, and um, I, and I, I this has got to be squirrels that are doing this. And I keep trying to find somebody who studied them. It's getting to the point where I'm thinking I'm going to have to figure out. Um, the, the study, you know, I, what I want to know is when they do this um, and, and what the, um, uh, why they do it, is is, there, is it possible for us to figure out why they stash these nuts up high like this? Is it a hedge against bad weather? Um, is it a convenience thing? Is it something 
where they come back because I, I find uh, some of these nuts I find like in the middle of summertime like they've been forgotten um, it's certainly not anything that benefits the trees because um, you know, trees when it, when a squirrel um, hides uh, or, you know buries a nut in the soil and they forget about it then we get a new tree but when they're stashed up here uh, like this, this was probably about five feet off the ground. Um, and it, it might've even been last year's walnut. Um, so we zoom in and look at it, but, um, it just, it fascinates me. And, and it, it I, there, there was a nut, um, now it did not last that long. And I wondered, was it the squirrel that left it on my front step that came back and got it? Or was it another squirrel or another animal that came along and thought, oh, look what I found. I'm going to take advantage of this. But it's it's something. So I guess um, to finish my thought, I would like to know, um, you know do the squirrels that um, stash these nuts, do they come back for them? What's the recovery rate of above ground nuts? Um, do animals besides squirrels take advantage? I know I've, I've heard about crows that will take walnuts and uh, put them in roadways and wait for cars to run over them and then eat them. Is, is that something, I mean, this just seems like it's asking to be stolen if the, you know, it's not, it's not really hidden at all. Um, but it's, uh, it's something, it's another thing. Once you start, train your eye or once your eye is familiar with this image, you start noticing it um, in multiple places, which is kind of the same thing with these things here. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Tekla with the Woods uh, again. And uh, up here at the top of this tree is a hornet's nest. Um, I've seen uh, several now on my walks to and from work. Uh, a lot of them are in parkway trees. Uh, and there's probably some in the backyards too, but I haven't looked there. Um, uh, I'm thankful to see they're, they're still up, they're, they're still intact, that um, people aren't cutting them down. I, I tried to zoom in on this one, but you can see it's been torn open pretty well already. This is the, um, if we go back here, this is the, the side of the nest that's facing the tree. So um, I'm gonna guess it was birds, although it, it, squirrels, uh, if uh, the branch will support them, they, they will walk out and they will tear these nests open too. But um, there's been a fair amount of uh, destruction already. Uh, the the larvae or the the frozen adults that were in there um, have started to be fed upon. There might be some more left over on this part of the nest, but again, if it's a squirrel, they're going to have a hard time reaching uh, the outside, whereas um, birds might prefer to feed from that side. But um, it's it's another fun thing uh, to look for as you're out enjoying our winter landscapes. Keep your eyes open for that. All right. I think that's the last of the slides for tonight, folks. Let's stop the share. Um, let's see. So, oh, still talking about the uh, our uh, landscape uh, mesh. Um, yeah, it, th that's the that's the, the 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 line everybody says. Wallace is that? Oh, it, it's it's photo degrades it's biodegrades it's it's gonna you know be gone in a year they say the same thing about balloons uh we were talking about balloons uh yesterday and how uh they're still being released um and uh, to memorialize uh, people who have passed that people love the the idea that the balloon is going up to heaven when really it's just floating litter that's going to come down and uh, has potential to harm uh, animals once it comes back down to earth. Uh, and Kay, yeah, 13 plus years um, and it still shows up through the yard. Yeah, um, I would say, uh, and I, I, I used to um, 
have a container in the freezer. I'm trying to think of what happened to it, but it was this uh, landscape mesh that uh, a water snake had become entangled in. And it the, the poor thing, it had actually cut through us. The, the snake was dead by the time I found it. Um, but it, it was so tangled up uh, in the mesh that it, um, you know, it died there. And again, um, as the bits and pieces do start to break apart, um, it doesn't mean that it's degrading. It, it, I mean, it, it does mean it's degrading, but it doesn't mean that it's not, uh, that it's safe because it, this stuff is still pretty strong. Um, you need a lot of strength to break through it. Um, gosh, that's a crummy note to end on. So let's, let's find something positive. Uh, let's, let's say, um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> any comments about anything? Um, if not, um, we, we're going to get some more snow. I think we're looking forward to a beautiful uh, next few days as the, the next round comes through. Temperatures are going to drop, so it's probably going to be here for a while. If you're a snow lover like me, thumbs up. And if you're uh, not so fond of the white stuff, I remember there's only 50 some days until the spring ephemerals project starts. How about that? focus on uh, what is yet to come. Everybody, thanks so much for your time tonight. Uh, appreciate it. And um, we will be back again next week, uh, eight o'clock for more good nature. Hope to see you then. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Thanks, Pam. 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 Thanks,